If you have your Bibles, uh, go with me over to the book of uh, 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 3. Actually, you know what? Put your finger there. Let's start in Exodus. Sorry. <laughs> Second book of the Bible. Exodus 33. Let's start there, huh? So Exodus 33 says this in verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me, he says. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also I have also found grace, uh, uh, you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. Underline that in your Bible. Show me now your way. In fact, Hillsong back in the 90s had a song called Show Me Your Ways, right? It was after this verse. So number one, he says, show me your way. And he says, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he says, what is God's response? My presence, right? So, so look up here for a second. So Moses cries out to God. As Moses is in intercession, Moses is interceding, Moses is praying. He says, God, he says, show me your way. God, show me your way. God's response is? my presence. Amen. So what is God's way in your life? It's his presence. It's the presence of God. That is the purpose and the plan of God for you and I to begin to walk in a greater presence of Jesus than ever before. Amen. Right. And so here he goes and he says, listen, he says, show me now your way that I may find grace in your sight. Consider this nation is your people. He says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. From how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us. So we shall be separate, your, your people and I, and all the people that are on the face of the earth, it says. And so the Lord said to Moses, I also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. And then he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Now, let's, let's just come back to that in a minute. So, number one, he, talks off of, he starts talking about the presence, the presence of God. What do we know about the Garden of Eden? Man was placed right smack dab in the presence of God, right? The Garden of Eden was the presence of God. The presence of God was there in abundance to the point where it actually clothed man. Man was clothed in his, he wasn't naked, he was clothed with God's presence. Adam and Eve were clothed in God's presence. They were completely covered in God's presence and God's glory. But when man disobeyed and man uh, went in, in, in violation of God's word, then at that point what happened is, is something began to change and he began to lose God's presence. To the point where when you get to the end of Genesis chapter 3, it says that God took man and put him out from the presence of the Lord. Right? That's how it ends, right? So... The, the, the Bible opens with the presence. It continues with the presence. Now Moses comes along, and he's talking about the presence. <laughs> Amen. Right? In fact, if you keep on going all the way into the New Testament, in Acts chapter 3, it talks about the presence of God. So all the way even into the New Testament is woven through the subject of the presence of God. So what's the first thing that happens to a believer when he gets saved? He begins to sense for the first time in his life or her life, what? The presence, right? The presence of God. The presence of God began to do something in their life. Can, can you put that graphic up? Is that cool? Are you okay to put that graphic up there for me? Because I want to show you something here in a second, and I think it will really help you. And so if you look up here, 
obviously man is number one. Uh, we say it like this. He has a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Yep. Right? Yep. You are a spirit. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. <laughs> Come on, right? Okay? So that's what you are. You are spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a body. Now, above it, I wrote the voice of each of those. So the voice of your spirit is your conscience. The voice of your mind, excuse me, the voice of your soul is your mind, will, and, and emotions. But the voice of your body is feelings. See? But look at it like this, okay? In the Old Testament, how did man have to worship God? We know the Ark of the, the, the Covenant was placed in the uh, tabernacle, right? And there was three parts to the tabernacle. There was the outer court, come on, help me, inner court and holy of holies. Okay, now watch this. You ready for this? The outer court, anybody could operate and go in the outer court, anybody. Male, female, clean, unclean, Jew, Gentile, everybody. True? It was lit by natural light. Okay? Inner court, man had to light it by his hand. So you have the seven golden candlesticks. True? So man had to light in the inner court, but only a select group could go into the inner court. But even a more select group could only go into the... Holy of Holies, but it is, let me just say it like this. The Jews had an, had an interesting word for each of those veils. There was a veil to get into the outer court, a veil to get into the inner court, and a veil to get into the Holy of Holies. And the veil to get into the outer court was called the way. The veil to get into the inner court was called the truth. And the way, the, the last end of the Holy of Holies was called the? And so when Jesus said to those Jewish leaders, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was telling these religious leaders, I am the only way to God's presence you will ever have. <laughs> they knew exactly what he was saying. And that's why they wanted to kill him for saying that. But let me say it to you like this in using this diagram. The outer court is a prophetic picture of the body. Natural man. Right? Yep. Saint, sinner, Jew, Gentile, male, female. Right? Everybody has a body. Yep. Right? But it's lit by the natural. Yep. Come on. Yep. Natural man follows natural ways. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said, the wind blows where it wills, and the flesh can only produce flesh, and the spirit can only produce spirit, right? That's why he says, you must be born again. Actually, in the, in the Greek, it's you must be born from above. That's what he really said. But it's 400-year-old English, so we say born again, but it's actually born from above, or born from the realm of spirit. <laughs> Come on, right? So outer court, natural. Inner court is a prophetic picture of the soul. Now watch this. The outer court is just like natural man. It's connected to the natural earth. Right? The spiritual man is connected to heaven. And the two meet in a place called soul. Heaven meets earth in a place called soul. <laughs> so literally, the heavenly part of you, your spirit man never sleeps, never gets tired, never gets cranky, never gets moody, never has a bad attitude. <laughs> Come on, right? Never passes someone out on Highway 95 and gives them that special finger. None of those things. <laughs> okay? That's your spirit man doesn't do those things. Carnal natural man does those things. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't, but right? But what happens is, is there's this battle in this middle ground. 
So there's this battle in this middle ground, which is a prophetic picture of the inner court. And the inner court has to be lit by natural. There has, man has to do something to light it. And you have to renew your mind. <laughs> right? So you have a part to play in your natural mind. But spiritually, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Come on, somebody. You are 100% uh, percent perfect in Christ. Right? But that's your spirit, man. That's not your soulish part. And that's not your body part. Right? And so, so that's why this is a prophetic picture of this whole thing. Well, guess what? What happens is, is this, is in the kingdom, is this, is that uh, when someone gets saved, whew, they feel that rush of God's presence. And there can be degrees, so to speak, of the tangible presence of God. So the tangible presence of God, we can cultivate God's presence by hunger. By your spiritual hunger, you can begin to cultivate God's presence in your life. And it can be shallow or it can be deep. And it's up to nobody else but you. <laughs> Come on, right? This is why a person can be sitting right next to another person and tears are running down their face and they're worshiping God and they're shaking and trembling under the power and the other person, his arms are crossed and they look like a frog blinking in a Texas hailstorm. Bored out of their skull. Why? Because they're more connected to earth than they are to heaven. Come on, amen? And this is what revival is all about. Revival is about getting the church more heavenly minded. <laughs> amen? That's why when people say, oh, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. No, I've never met anyone too heavenly minded. Ever. That's just some, car, some kind of a, a lingo that somebody who's carnal came up with. <laughs> because otherwise, Jesus was uh, the worst of all of them. <laughs> Amen. Right? So, praise God. So, so here, Jesus, uh, excuse me, uh, so Moses says, my presence is going to go with you, and it'll give you rest. Right? So, what does the presence of God do? It gives you spiritual rest. It brings a rest in your life. Then he goes on to say this, and he says, you know, if your presence doesn't go with you, we're not going to go, but let it be known to you that we found grace in your sight. And then he goes on to say, I'll do this thing that you've said. In verse 18, God, uh, uh, he says, please now show me your glory. So now man is crying out to God for the glory of God, the tangible presence of God. And then he says, I'll make my goodness pass before you, and I'll cover you, right? But it was the goodness of God. That's why the Bible says the goodness of God leads people to repent. Why? Because it's the presence of God. <laughs> the goodness of God. When, when God is good to somebody and they don't deserve it, <laughs> right? When God is good and he just showers goodness, when you've just been a scoundrel, <laughs> And you deserve judgment, but he gives you mercy. Right? This is why, uh, go with me over to the book of Hebrews. I'll show you a verse the Holy Spirit gave me a while ago. I think it'll, you'll like it. In Hebrews chapter 4, everyone say, I want more of the presence of God. <laughs> <laughs> so Hebrews 4, very well-known verse. Many of you can quote it, but I don't want you to quote it. I want you to read it with your own eyes, okay? You can just leave that picture up there, okay? So Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He says, obtain mercy, find grace. Obtain mercy, find grace. Obtain mercy, but find grace. Why? Now listen to this. We started with Moses. Moses says, Lord, if I found grace in your sight. I think Moses is the second person in the Bible to find grace. The first person in the Bible to find grace is a guy by the name of Noah. 
Noah, excuse me, Genesis 6 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's the first time grace ever comes into the Bible. So he finds grace. Moses finds grace. Now watch this. Six times through the entire Old Testament, man finds grace. David finds grace. You'll find scriptures. This one found grace. They found grace. Six times. How many of you know that's not the number of God? What is God's number? Seven. So who is the seventh one to find grace? Guess who it is? The church. We found grace to help. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. That's why you find grace to help. <laughs> Come on. Right? In the time of need. Right? But it says that we obtain mercy. So why do we obtain mercy and find grace? You find grace for yourself, but you obtain mercy to give to somebody who doesn't deserve it. So in the presence of God, two things are happening. Two hands are up. One is obtaining a grace. The other, excuse me, the other is finding grace. And the other one is obtaining mercy. So that when you minister to man outside of here, you give mercy. And the moment you give mercy, you give the goodness of God, which is the presence and glory of God. And you begin to demonstrate to mankind, here is the mercy of God, right? So, I mean, if you look at all of the Gospels, what do all of the people cry out for miracles when they want to be healed? What do they say? Son of David, have a miracle on me. Is that what they say? Oh, no, they say, have mercy on me. Ah, wow. So they don't deserve it, but they're asking for it anyway. Right? And so that's what the mercy of God is. Praise God, right? Okay, so now go back to Samuel. We can't leave Samuel there in 1 Samuel 3. So 1 Samuel 3, verse 1, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now Eli, if you don't know this, is a prophetic picture of dead religion with no power. Dead religious form with no power. And the Bible says his children were wickedness. <laughs> Come on, right? Okay. So here he starts off, Samuel ministers to the Lord. What does Samuel mean? Anyone know? He will hear the Lord. That's what it means. Samuel, he will hear the Lord, is ministering to the Lord. What did your pastor have us do just a minute ago? We were quiet. We just ministered to the Lord. Come on, right? He ministered back to us. Hallelujah. Right? So as we're ministering to the Lord, right? So it says, and the boy Samuel, hearing, the, uh, he, hearing, he will hear the Lord, ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass that while he was laying down in his place, where was his place? He laid, get this, are you ready for this? He laid next to the Ark of the Covenant, which is a prophetic picture of the presence of God. So where did Samuel sleep? Next to that presence. Where was he? Ah, he was, in, he was in spirit. And as he slept next to that presence, a voice came. The presence of God. The presence of God brought the voice of God. And it says, it came to pass at that time while he was laying down in his place that his eyes had become so dim that he could not see. And the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of God where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down that the Lord called to Samuel and he said, here am I. And so he ran to Eli and said, here I am. And you called me. And he said, I didn't call. Lay, lay down again. And so he went and he laid down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And so Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And he said, I didn't call you, go lay down. And Samuel did not yet know the Lord for the word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again a third time. And so he arose, went to Samuel, excuse me, went to Eli. And he said, here I am for you did call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lay down and it shall be that if he calls you that you will say, speak Lord. For your servant hears. And Samuel went and laid down in his place, and the Lord came and stood, and called. Uh, the, uh, the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, "Speak, for your servant hears." And then the Lord began to minister to him out of that. But look at that here. 
in that place of the presence, in that place of the Ark of the Covenant, God begins to speak to man. <laughs> As we begin to find a love for the presence, you know, uh, it's easy to say, oh man, I'm tired or I'm tired. You know, I always say it like this. When were you not tired? <laughs> the day you were born, everyone said, don't touch him. He's tired. You know what I mean? At the end of your life, they're going to say, don't mess with him. He's tired. <laughs> You go on vacation. Here it is, summertime. Ah, praise the Lord. People go on vacation. They're like, whew, I can't wait to go home. I need to get some rest. <laughs> so you went on vacation to get rest, and actually you came back more tired. <laughs> so guess what? Your flesh is always tired. You ever notice that? The moment your alarm goes off, your flesh is like, oh, man, give me 10 minutes. I'll be your best friend. Your flesh never has enough. But guess what? Same thing is true with your spirit, man. Your spirit, man, is saying, come on. Come on. Just sacrifice. Just go for it. Just go for it. Just go for it. Just don't listen to your flesh. Your flesh has been, your flesh has been messed up for years. <laughs> don't listen to your flesh, man. Don't listen to the carnal, natural, man. Listen to your spirit, man. Go to the presence. Get hungry for the presence. Uh, I'll tell you a, a funny story. So, uh, my wife and I, we travel and we minister in so many different places, in churches and different countries. And I just came, like, 72 hours ago, I was in Norway, okay? So, in, in you know, this week I fly to Portland. And then from Portland, then I go to Cleveland, Ohio. And then Cleveland, Ohio, then I go to... Texas, and then from Texas, then I end up in Nigeria, and so I'm going to all of these different countries and stuff and different places, and I minister sometimes as much as 300 times a year, okay? So I'm in church more than most, <laughs> you understand? So 300 times a year. So when I go to church, so say for example, we were off this weekend and we go to church, we go with the mindset of this is that we're going for the presence. God, you're going to speak to us this weekend. We stir our spirit man up. Come on, right? We shake our flesh and we say, no, flesh, you're going to praise the Lord. No, flesh, now you're going to hear from God, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now in the natural, my natural body is saying it's 2 a.m. My mind says I'm in Norway right now. <laughs> so in Norway, it's about 2 or 3 a.m., <laughs> Okay. So, but I'm not listening to my flesh. I'm listening to my spirit, man. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So you got to sometimes just shake yourself, amen? And you got to shake yourself and say, God, I'm going to go for it tonight. I'm not going to go weary and, and miss what you're going to do and miss the opportunity, right? Amen. So many times we've seen people miss the move of the Holy Spirit, miss a revival because of being tired. Could you, could you imagine in the upper room? 120 people there for all of those days waiting for this Holy Spirit. They didn't know what it looked like. I mean, a guy could have walked in with a red hat and a backpack, and they would have said, he would have said, I'm Holy Spirit. Oh, hi, Holy Spirit. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> they didn't know what the Holy Spirit looked like. They didn't know what to expect. Jesus just told them to wait for it. What about those who went and left the night before? <sighs> said, man, he has not come yet, so I'm out of here. <laughs> could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine? What about the wise men? We always, you know, talk about, you know, the manger scene and all of that stuff, you know, at Christmas time. But and not to ruin your Christmas song, but I'll just, you know, the wise men weren't there when Jesus was born. The Bible says he was a little boy. <laughs> and he wasn't in the manger. They didn't live in the manger. He was just born there. And then the Bible says they went to a house. Okay, I know it, you know, ruins it, but uh, it's the truth, okay? <laughs> and the Bible never says there was three kings, it just says they came with three gifts. You look it up, this is Matthew chapter 2. So Matthew 2 says they came with three kinds of gifts. There could have been two kings, there could have been 102. We don't know how many kings there were. But they came with three kinds of gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we know that they were Babylonian Jews coming from probably many hundreds of miles away. It probably took them years to get there. <laughs> Could you imagine that they got to the meeting of Jesus and like, boy, this better be a darn good meeting. I'm going to sit here. I better get something good. I came a long ways. <laughs> no, they didn't come to get. They came to give. I said they came to give. Right? The Bible says, and they worshiped him. 
And it says, and they opened their treasures. Right? So how did they worship? They opened their treasures. In other words, they gave. They gave their best. They worshiped out of their treasure. Amen? That's how the spiritual man does. That's how the spiritual man does. And guess what? Out of that, the presence of God led them, the Bible says, home another direction. So supernatural direction came as man began to go for the presence of God and begin to sacrifice in the presence, just like she was encouraging us on the drums. Right? Is that true? So out of sacrifice, the presence came and the voice of God spoke. I mean, I could tell you of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times where I've seen the exact same thing. I'll tell you a funny story. We, we went and we just moved home to Minnesota after being in Florida for, for 13 years. So this last year was really a test for my flesh, let me tell you, all right? So, but we used to live in Fort Lauderdale. And so when we, while we were there, um, we ministered in many different churches, but there was a church just down the road. I don't know how to nicely say it. They didn't like me. <laughs> Can I say it like, you ever have someone, they just don't like you. Come on, raise your hand, anybody? Oh, I don't feel so bad. All right, praise the Lord. So this one church just down the road, they just didn't like us. And I, nothing in particular, it was just whatever. And uh, so one day I heard there was this prophet that was coming to speak. So I said, Susie, let's go see that prophet. So, oh man, you know that church? <laughs> They don't like us at all. They don't like us. So I said, I already worked it out. What we're going to do is, while worship is going, we're going to slip in the back. And we're going to sit in the last row, and they won't even know we're there. Right? So I got this whole thing worked out in my head. Okay? So we get in the car, and uh, as soon as we get in the car, I begin to decree out loud and prophesy to myself out loud. And to both of us, I said, the moment we get to the meeting, God, I said, I am decreeing right now that if you don't speak to anybody in the service tonight, we're getting a prophetic word. And uh, we meant it. We went and we said it, God, we just say in the name of Jesus, we just lay hold of it. We're going to hear from heaven tonight. So we get to this church and there's about 300 people there. It was on a Friday night. And so we get to the church, exactly like I said, we slipped in the back, we hid in the back, kind of way in the last row. And uh, the, the pastor went and got up, took the microphone. And as soon as he took the microphone, he had a big smile until he saw me. <laughs> Thank God I love your pastor. So <laughs> they're Holy Ghost people. So anyways, anyways, um, so he sees me, his whole countenance just falls. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I just kind of lean out. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> I'm like trying to hide, you know. And uh, so he begins kind of the, the meeting and stuff. And then he brings this, this prophet up. And the prophet starts to preach. And the prophet gets about 10 minutes, 13, 15 minutes tops into his sermon. And he says, I can't continue. Would that blonde couple in the last row stand up? And for 15 minutes, he starts to prophesy to us. And nobody else got a prophetic word the whole night. And I wonder, I wonder, I just wonder if it's because of the demand that we placed. Come on, somebody. On the word of the Lord. Instead of going and just kind of kicking tires and seeing what happens, what about if we went with an attitude of, God, I'm going to get something tonight. I'm going to get healing tonight. I'm going to get restoration tonight. I'm going to get a prophetic, whatever it is. God, I'm going to put a demand on it so strong with my spiritual hunger. God, you've got to move. You've got to speak. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, what if we came with that mindset that all of a sudden, God, I'm not just coming to kick spiritual tires, but I'm coming for the presence, and God, I'm going to hear from you tonight. I mean, that's just what we've kind of learned to cultivate our, our spiritual life is this, is that when we go to church, we just say, all right, Lord, you're going to speak. You're going to speak to us. I even say it out loud sometimes to myself. I just say, the moment the worship starts, from the time the worship starts until the preaching ends, God, you're talking and I'm hearing. <laughs> I do. I'm telling you, I promise you, I really honestly do this. And I believe that as a result of it, it's, it's just like, it's like a magnet to the voice of Jesus. 
It's like a magnet to the presence of God. <laughs> Amen. It's like you just like you grab a hold of God's attention because of your spiritual hunger. It's your spiritual hunger that becomes a, a, a conduit or a, or a magnet to the presence of God. That you just say, God, I want you to move. God, I want you to speak. God, I want you to change this thing in my life. Help me, Jesus. Tonight, I'm going to lay this thing on the altar. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Amen. And the moment we come with that mindset, all of a sudden, something happens. I mean, I could tell you in my own life, I, I went and uh, I shared here last year some of my testimony, and I got saved in the early 80s and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I went right in the ministry by 1986. I was a 19-year-old young minister. And so here I am, whatever, 20 years old. And uh, so here I am, uh, I went to North Carolina, and I began to minister and, and ended up in New Jersey and California. I was a pastor out there for a while. And, and then uh, in 1994, I moved to Tulsa and began to uh, um, transfer into the evangelistic ministry. And so since 1994, we've ministered in like 30 countries and 48 states and 1,200 churches. <laughs> That's a lot of faces to look at. <laughs> okay, so about 12, literally about 1,200 churches in the last 25 years, you know, and, and in so doing, uh, uh, way back in the mid-90s, about 1998, I heard about up here in Minnesota, there was a revival that broke out, a revival broke out here in the Twin Cities, and uh, so in this uh, church in Roseville, I had heard about this revival, and so I heard that they were just so crazy for the presence of God that uh, the pastor <laughs> went and literally emptied the church bank account and made the whole church fly to Pensacola to go to the revival <laughs> for two weeks. He literally told everyone, you're all taking your vacation, and we're all going as a church. 200 people, because <laughs> he said either we're going to close the doors or we're going to have revival, one of the two. We're not going to keep just doing church. Come on, somebody. And that's what he said right here in Roseville. And so sure enough, I was scheduled to minister there a couple weeks after they came back. And so I get there a couple weeks after they came back, after they came back. And so I get up to minister, long story short, uh, it was like instantly I could just sense a dimension change. I got to the church that Friday night. And everyone was at the church one hour early to intercede and cry out to God for the visitors that would come that night. They were all around the altar. It was 6 o'clock. And I said to the usher, I said, oh, man, did I, did I miss the beginning of the meeting or something to get up here? I drove up here from Tulsa. He said, no, 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 no. He said, we start at 7, but he said, we intercede from 6 till 7. Everyone takes off work early to come to church to intercede for the visitors. I'll just try this church over here. Everyone takes off work early on Friday nights to intercede at the church for the visitors that are coming. Come on, right? A mindset difference, right? And so that night, I'm telling you, the presence of God was so thick in that place. I mean, you could sense, you could taste. I mean, the presence of God was just so thick, it was unbelievable. And I've been in some awesome meetings with major, major ministries, and I've, I've met a lot of different people in, in our ministry. But that night was the night that I experienced the presence of God in an un, a, a, a way that I've never felt in my entire life. That night, I went to, to, um, to go and pray at the end of the message. And so when I got up to pray, I just got done preaching, and I got up to pray, and I closed my eyes. And when I closed my eyes, I went into a vision. And then the, as I went into the vision, I was at the Mount of Transfiguration. And instead of seeing Jesus and Moses and Elijah, mind you, I lived in Tulsa. I see Jesus, Kenneth Copeland, and Kenneth Hagin. And the Holy Spirit said, you gave a place in your heart to these men. I never told you to give them. And he took them away and he said, this is my son and hear ye him. And when that happened, I just, instantly the vision changed, and I'm in the altar getting prayer ministry. They had a, a prayer team that they had kind of amassed. And so I'm getting prayer. <laughs> so I'm coming out of this vision, and I'm like, 
Lord, <laughs> hello. I just drove 11 hours from Tulsa. I am the guest minister tonight. <laughs> How can I be the one in the altar getting prayer? I close my eyes. I go back in the vision. I'm back in the altar. And so finally, in obedience, I just went and I told the pastor, I said, listen, this, I'm just going to be obedient to this vision. So I just jumped in the altar. And when they went to pray for me, the fire of God hit me so hard that I begin to weep uncontrollably. I don't mean three, four tears ran down my face. I mean, I cried so hard until I had a nosebleed down the front of my suit. To the point where for four solid days, I never came out of that presence. Four days. The pastor will tell you today that for four days, I never stopped weeping uncontrollably. I told him, I can't, I can't preach. I can't stop crying. I'm crying so hard for four days. In what? In that presence. It was like God was doing something so deep in my life. <laughs> it would lift long enough for me to preach, and then I just kind of dove in the altar again afterwards. <laughs> Amen. But there's something about that presence. I'm telling you, brother and sister, there can be a dimension of the presence of God that is bigger than religion. I said it's bigger than religion. This is not about religion. Religion is a soulish thing. It's carnal, natural man's way of trying to make a light that will light the way. Because in the Holy of Holies, the only thing that lit the Holy of Holies was God's presence himself. He said, do not put anything to light it in there. I will light it myself. <laughs> Come on. And that's why Proverbs says this, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, lighting all the inward parts of the belly. Amen? Amen. So that's why, you, we, we're, that's why we're led by the spirit. We follow the spirit. We follow the voice of the spirit. Amen. And we, so do, we do so by following that presence. And the moment we follow that presence, that presence begins to change us. <laughs> It changes us. It begins to minister to us. It ministers to a, a carnal mindset. Come on, right? It begins to say, come on now. Come on. Get out of your soulish man. Get out of your carnal man. <laughs> Get out of your bad attitude. <laughs> come on, right? Get out of religion. And it says, come over into the spirit. That's what it says. It's pulling you to the spirit. Will you help me on the keys? Yeah. Right? It begins to pull us. It begins to, the Spirit of God wants to change those things in your life. Some people, they sit for year after year after year after year, and they sit, and it's like they, they're just bound. They're just broken. They're just, they're devastated. And it's like, it's like they're never changed. Because they try to handle it in the soulless part of man, and there's no answers in the inner court. The only answers you, you want are all in the Holy of Holies. It's only in the spirit realm. It's only in the spirit that you're healed. <laughs> Come on, right? This is where New Age tries to reach man. Because New Age knows there's more. So all they can do is soulish. Everything is soulish. It's all soulish, soulish, soul. Deals with the soul. But if we begin to have a different mindset, now listen to this. So remember I said the Ark of the Covenant was a prophetic picture of God's presence. Are you ready for this? It was in the Holy of Holies until the book of, I believe it was the book of uh, Jeremiah or so. So by the time Malachi chapter 4 comes, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. The ark is gone. And the religious system kept going, acting like the presence was there while the presence wasn't there. The ark was gone. For 400 years, man never heard God's voice. 400 years. From Malachi 4 to Matthew chapter 1. 400 plus years, man is just doing religion out of the soul religion, religion, religious systems, and generation, literally 10 generations goes by. More than that, right? 
and living without God's presence, living out without God's voice. And man was cool with it. Hey, that's cool. We're at least doing, we're killing the animals, slaughtering them, slicing, the blood's running. But they still had no presence. And so when Jesus comes, are you ready for this? Jesus is an, a prophetic picture of revival. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, what happens when he dies? What happens? Somebody say it out loud. The veil was rent top to bottom. And what happened? Man could see they didn't have the presence of God for 400 years. He revealed that you, they were living in a dead religion for 400 years. That's what he did. Phew, that quick. That's what revival does. Revival reveals. I say it like this. Revival doesn't bring division. Revival reveals division that's already there anyway. That's all it does. It just opens the door so you can see what's really going on. Amen. That's all revival does. That's what revival, that's what happened to me. It was revival that day. Everything changed in my life. February 1998, I can tell you, I can tell you exactly what happened to this day. I, I wrote a whole book on it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was something that so transformed my life. <laughs> I'm like, God, that's, I, I got to live for that. I said, God, if I'm going to just go to churches to give them information about God, go find someone else. I'm not the guy. <laughs> you want information about God? Go, I don't know, suck on YouTube or something. I don't know, man, because that's not, I'm not the dude for that. I, this is my calling, is to stir the, is to irritate the religious. <laughs> this is my destiny, <laughs> amen, is to stir the church. Come on, Princeton, it's time for revival. The church wants revival. Your church wants revival. People want revival. But often what happens is it's easier to just have dead religion. It's easier. It's a whole lot easier. Just religious motions. Don't get anyone upset. Don't get Mr. Big Bucks upset or sister so-and-so. Don't get her upset. And it just continues rel religion. That's what, that's what religion does. How do I know this? Because I see it every single week, almost. Not every week, but you understand. Not this week, amen. Like Pastor Vern said, not this week. <laughs> Come on, right? But I'm telling you, all over the world, literally, from one end of the globe to the other, many churches are content with just keeping the religious machine going. And they don't know that there's nothing behind them. <laughs> There's no presence there. You can say there's presence, but that's no, there's no presence. <laughs> you can, it doesn't matter what you call it. Some people are like, we're having revival. No, you're just having extended meetings. Don't call it that. It's like this. I used to live, in, I used to live 20 minutes from Philadelphia. I know a Philly cheesesteak, <laughs> okay? I lived there. I could see the Walt Whitman Bridge, okay? So when people say, oh, go to... Subway, they've got a Philadelphia cheesesteak. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> that's what it says it is, but that's not what it is because it doesn't taste the same. Guess what? You can call, I mean, you, you could put lipstick on a pig and call it a, you know, a queen, you know, but it doesn't make it one. <laughs> Come on, right? And it's, it's the same thing. And that's what, that's what revival does. Revival comes and it reveals it's raw. It's never pretty. It's usually messy. <laughs> it's usually a revealer. It upsets. We, we minister right after that time in, in Roseville when God totally transformed my life and my whole ministry, everything changed. We'd go to churches and bust out revivals. Some churches liked it, some didn't. I mean, I could tell you of, of hundreds of stories and not even, not even dent them. I can tell you, we were in Grand Forks, Grand Forks on a Sunday morning, and I was there. They invited me just for two meetings, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I'm like, well, I'm not a Sunday morning, Sunday night guy. I'm here for a revival, okay? 
So they, they were kind of checking me out, see if they liked me, you know, see if I would let the machine keep going. And so anyway, so I get there and I'm just about to go up onto the stage and the Holy Spirit whispers this, do you want to hit a bunt or a home run? I said, what? <laughs> he said, do you want to be invited back or do you want to break this thing through? <laughs> Come on, somebody. I was like, oh God, this is not going to be good. <laughs> oh Jesus, help me Lord, <laughs> take me out. And so, and I just began to go for it. And I just began to, for 30 minutes, just pour it out my heart like this. I began to talk about raw revival stuff. People started weeping all over the church. One guy was one of the major leaders in the church. I mean, he cried so hard, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He fell on the altar while I was preaching. Conviction was so strong on him. He just shook on the altar, just bawling. He was about 65, bawling his guts out. And then I just kept going. And then a couple people came running up and they start to pet him like a Labrador retriever, you know, oh, because they're soulish. That's what the soul does. The soul doesn't know what to do with spirit. So the soul is like, oh, like a little Labrador retriever, you know, oh, just pet it. That doesn't help because it's a spiritual thing. And so I said to the church, I said, look, I said, when something spiritual happens, the church doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> when revival is breaking forth, I said, don't touch him. He's not a dog. Go sit down and leave him alone. He doesn't need you to pet him. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? I mean, come on, somebody. <laughs> Is this all right tonight? Is this okay? Is this all right? I'm just being real tonight. I have no notes tonight. I just heard the Spirit of God speak to me about the presence of God. And so I'm just kind of going with what I had in my heart. And, and uh, so here's this guy, bawling his guts out, Grand Forks, right? Balling his guts out. End of the service. This is now the service ends at one in the, you know, one in the afternoon. So, oh man, upset people. They missed the Vikings game and blah, 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 blah. blah. And um, so, uh, but this guy, this dude's still crying. And then he gets up and he calls all of his adult children. He said, and he says to the pastor, I need to have you with me. I need to say something to my family. And so the pastor tells me, you go on, get something to eat. I got to deal with something with this. I don't know what's going on here, you know. And uh, he just begins to bear his soul. He just begins to start off and say, I've been a horrible father and a terrible husband. And I didn't know it until the presence of God came and revealed me to me. And he's crying and crying and crying. And he begins to, one by one, he begins to apologize to his adult children and to his wife and just brokenness. I mean, just people were being set free. This went on all day long. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. There was deliverance in that. There was freedom in that. There was presence. He came that Sunday night. He literally stayed all afternoon, never went to lunch, came that Sunday evening, and he got up and testified. He said, this is the first time I felt God's presence since I first got saved. He said, I'll be honest. He said, I'm a deacon in the church. <laughs> He's one of the main deacons, one of the main board members. And he goes, I haven't felt God's presence in 30 some years. <sighs> Amen. So tonight, I challenge you in the name of Jesus to begin to stir up and provoke a hunger. Provoke a hunger on the inside of you. Provoke a hunger by the presence. Provoke a, a hunger for that presence. Begin to say, Lord, if nobody else gets it, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch your heart tonight. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna hear the Lord like Samuel. I, he will hear the Lord. 